Hello, my dear friends. This is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is the Parsha Podcast, and this week is Parshas Nasso. I hope you're doing well wherever you may be listening to this podcast. I hope you had a wonderful Shavu. It's the festival we just celebrated on Monday and Tuesday, starting from Sunday night going to Tuesday night. I had the great privilege of studying Torah the whole night, as is traditional. I stayed up with my two oldest boys, Akiva and Yeshua, and Torch ran a Shavuos program, and I was asked to give a class, which I did, which is always weird for me to give a class on a festival where we don't do any work and we don't use any electronics. It's really weird for me to give a class or a speech or a lecture, and I'm always thinking, wow, this could have been an amazing podcast, but there's no microphone in sight, and I feel like the words that I'm saying are just going up into the air and disappearing into the ether without being preserved. So I gave a class, and the class was titled, The Six Biggest Questions of Shavuos, and it was really lovely, it was really delightful, but of course it wasn't recorded, but I was thinking, maybe next year... I'll make a podcast out of it so everyone the world over can enjoy. But Shavuos was utterly delightful, and I hope you enjoyed yours as well. And I got a chance over the course of the festival to prepare a podcast for this week, Parshas Nasso, and here it is. So this is special Torah, courtesy of the festival of Shavuos. So our Parsha begins with the continuation of last week's Parsha. Namely, the counting of the Levites and the apportioning of the responsibility of each Levite family. And then we're told about cleaning out the camp from people who are impure and some of the laws of theft. And then we have the Sota, the laws of the Sota, the suspected adulteress. And then there's the Nazir, a person who accepts upon themselves a vow to abstain from wine and from cutting their hair and coming into contact with dead people. We have the priestly blessings and finally, the Parsha ends with the gifts of the princes. First, they give a gift of six covered wagons or carriages and 12 oxen to be used in the transportation of the parts of the tabernacle once it's disassembled. And then we have the 12-day tribute. Each day of 12 successive days, another one of the princes of the tribes brings a very elaborate and identical tribute to celebrate the inauguration of the tabernacle. And this is what we want to talk about in this week's Parsha podcast, the gifts of the princes. And it begins in chapter 7 of our Parsha, of the book of Numbers. It's the first day of Nisan. There's been about a half a year of preparing for this moment. The tabernacle has been erected. We had seven days of inauguration. Now it's day eight, that same vaunted day eight that we heard so much about. It's actually the fourth Parsha to be discussing the same day, the first day of Nisan. This is nearly a year after the Exodus. The last Parsha in the book of Exodus, Parsha Pekude, twice in the book of Leviticus, Shemini and Achari, and now here in the book of Numbers, Parsha's Nusso, all four parashiyos are discussing the very same day, the first day of Nisan. That is a nice little bit of trivia. The Mishkan is being erected once and for all, and now begins the daily operations, the normal operations of the tabernacle. And the heads of the tribes, beginning in chapter 7, they bring a gift. They bring six covered wagons or carriages, and they give it to Moshe, and that's going to be used for the Levites when they transport the tabernacle. They don't have to lug the beams and the curtains and all the parts of the tabernacle by themselves. They could put it onto the wagons and it'll be carried in the wagons and pulled by the 12 oxen. And that way the tabernacle will be transported easily and more efficiently. Now, who are these princes? Who are these people who are bringing this offering, this gift? So Rashi in verse 2 of chapter 7 tells us two interesting things about these people. Number one, Rashi tells us that these people were featured in last week's parsha. Last week, Moshe and Aaron count the entirety of the people, not the tribe of Levi initially, just the 12 tribes of Israel. And 
Alongside them, you have the 12 heads of the tribe. Moshe and Aaron are doing the counting. And alongside them, we have these 12 people, the very same people who are bringing the gift of the 12 oxen and the six covered wagons and carriages to transport the tabernacle. Now, it's important to note that in last week's parasha, Moshe and Aaron are counting the people. And together with them, as Moshe and Aaron are counting the people, you have these 12 heads of the tribes, even though if you look at Rashi carefully, it's clear that it's only Moshe and Aaron doing the counting. It seems like the heads of the tribes, the princes, are just there to watch. So that's the first thing we know about these princes, the heads of the tribes. They were there with Moshe and Aaron when they counted the people. Rashi tells us something else interesting about these princes. Their backstory. How did they become princes? What were their credentials? Why were they nominated for this post? So Rashi tells us, quoting from our sages, that these were the policemen in Egypt. In Egypt, of course, the Jewish people were slaves. And the Egyptians were enslaving them. And the Jews, the Jewish slaves, had a certain quota of bricks that they had to produce, a certain amount of work that they do every day. And the Egyptians, they hired or they appointed some other Jews to be like the police officers, to be the overseers, to be the taskmasters over their Jewish brethren, kind of like the the capos in the Holocaust. And we're told that these 12 people were hired by the Egyptians to oversee the Jewish brethren, but they were righteous and they were kind and they absorbed blows on behalf of the people. They were so righteous, these 12 men, that when it came a choice, so to speak, for them, whether or not they're going to throw the masses, the Jewish slaves under the bus, or they themselves are going to suffer at the whip, the whips at the hands of the Egyptians, they suffered. And as a result of that, they were made into the princes and the heads of the tribe. And these same 12 people, who last week's parasha counted the Jewish people or oversaw Moshe and Aaron counted the Jewish people, they now come and make an offer of oxen and covered wagons for the Levites to carry the components of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, when it is in transport. It's so heavy, so many beams, so many curtains. To carry it themselves will be so backbreaking. Let's get them some wagons and oxen, and they will carry it. Now, there's another clue to the story of the princes featured in Rashi a little bit later on in chapter 7. Rashi tells us that there's a reason why these princes were so eager to offer a gift at the inauguration of the tabernacle. And he tells us that initially, when six months prior, there was a fundraising drive to gather the various components for the Mishkan, these same princes, they delayed, they tarried, they dithered in offering a donation of gold or silver or precious wool or expensive wood or various other leather things, components that were needed for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. And the reason for that is that they said, let everyone else give, and whatever they don't give, we will make up. We'll make up the difference. And indeed, the people were incredibly generous, and there was nothing left for them to give. And the only thing that was available for them to give is the Shoham stones and the Miluim stones, the Shoham stones that go on the shoulder straps, if you will, of the Apho, the, the apron-like garment, and the Miluim, which are the stones that go on the breastplate of the high priest. That's what they gave because everything else was already donated by the masses, by the people. And the Torah is critical of these princes. They are rebuked all the way back in chapter 36 of the book of Exodus. They're rebuked and there is a letter deducted from their name. They are the Nassim, the princes, but there's one Yud missing from their name because they did not donate early. And now, when there's a second opportunity to donate, they're not going to make the same mistake and they take initiative. And now, when it comes to the inauguration 
six months after the original fundraising drive, they jump ahead and they say, we want to give the oxen and the wagons. Now, you may remember a couple of years ago, I was in Israel and we had a special Parsha podcast that I actually recorded from the Western Wall in Jerusalem. I actually managed to sneak my microphone past the guards because it initially had triggered the x-ray machine, and they said, oh, no, no, you can't take the microphone to to the Kotel Plaza. You have to leave it over here. But then I saw that the guard was a little bit distracted, so I said, I just grabbed it and ran, and they didn't come after me, and they still haven't found me, I guess. So I recorded a podcast right opposite the Western Wall, and the subject of that podcast was to understand what exactly these princes did wrong and why was their leadership flawed? Why were they criticized? But now we're following up with their story. Later on, they're not going to make the same mistake. And when it comes to the inauguration of the tabernacle, they're jumping ahead. We're going to give these six covered wagons and the 12 oxen for the Levites to help them in the transportation of the tabernacle. Now, the Torah says that Moshe initially refused it. And the reason for this, there are a variety of reasons offered in the commentaries. So the Sephorno, for example, he suggests that Moshe thought that it was appropriate that the entire tabernacle be carried manually. It's more honor for it to be carried manually, not to be carried, not to be outsourced, if you will, to the oxen and the wagon. So he initially didn't want to do it, and then God says, take it, so he took it. I saw an amazing midrash quoted by Rabbeinu B'chaya as to why Moshe was hesitant to accept the six covered carriages and the 12 oxen, the Midrash says that had these oxen and wagons been accepted, then they would have been part of the tabernacle. Part of the tabernacle is these animals and these wagons that are used to carry and transport The tabernacle, once it's disassembled, bringing it from the place where it was previously assembled to the next place with the nation and camps. And therefore, what would have happened if one of these oxen died or one of the carriages lost a wheel? In that instance, says the Midrash, that something that's included in the original Mishkan breaks, in the original tabernacle breaks, then the entirety of the tabernacle would have been invalidated. You have to have everything in fully operational working order in order for the tabernacle to continue its operations. And ultimately, God commands Moshe to accept it. Take these wagons and oxen and give it to the families of Gershon and Merari, but not to the family of Kahas. They have to carry on their shoulder. And the Midrash concludes that God tells Moshe Verse 5, take it from them and they shall be, says the Midrash, that the Almighty gave a blessing, so to speak, to these oxen and these wagons that they will endure and they will be forever. And the Midrash brings various different opinions as to how long these 12 oxen lasted. According to the first opinion, they lasted for hundreds of years until the tabernacle was put aside and a permanent temple was built by Solomon. And these 12 oxen were still alive, still kicking, and were actually offered as sacrifices in Solomon's temple. That's one opinion of the Midrash. Another opinion that the Midrash brings is that actually, somewhere in the world, these 12 oxen are still alive and kicking. Even today, they have not gotten old, they have not withered, they have not gotten injured, they're still around today. And concludes the Midrash with a very nice lesson. Behold, it is a lesson for us that these oxen, these bovines, who became connected to the tabernacle, the Almighty gave them life and vitality, and they're around forever, all the more so the Jewish people, if we cleave to God, we too will have eternal life. So here's the next step in the progression of the princes. They were policemen in Egypt, and they displayed gallantry and heroism 
in absorbing some of the blows intended for their Jewish brethren, and they're made into princes, but they don't donate for the initial fundraising drive when the process to build the tabernacle commenced. And now the tabernacle is finished and they're very eager to donate and to be generous and they bring the oxen and the wagons. Now, right after this happens, they bring a second set of gifts and that is the 12 days of gifts starting from the first day of Nisan. So first through the 12th day of Nisan, each tribe or each head of the tribe brought a very lavish tribute 21 animals, a silver basin and a silver bowl, each brimming with flour and oil and a gold ladle full of incense, a very generous donation. And again, Rashi tells us that Moshe initially refused to accept it, and he only accepted it after God approved of it, and it was staggered over 12 days. And we spoke about this at length on the rebroadcast podcast, why the Torah repeats the identical gift, one after another, 12 tribes over 12 days, or 12 heads of tribes, 12 princes over the course of 12 days. But Rashi tells us something interesting. What motivated this second gift? On the first day of Nisan, they're inspired to give. They didn't give last time, several months prior, when the initial fundraising drive happened. But now they bring the oxen and the wagons, and on that same day, after they give the first gift, they want to give a second gift. The 21 animals and the silver basin and bowl and the gold ladle, etc. What inspired it? So Rashi in verse 10 tells us that after they donated the covered wagons and the 12 oxen, their hearts were inspired to give even more. And they wanted to bring sacrifices. They brought 21 sacrifices apiece and other gifts and tributes to inaugurate the tabernacle. Rashi tells us that there was a ripple effect here. They gave something first, and that kind of broke the ice, and they kind of liked it. They took initiative, they gave something, it was accepted, and they said, you know what, we want to give more. And indeed, they gave more. And that begins the longest chapter in the Torah, and we have an almost complete verbatim retelling of the 12 identical tributes, And the tabernacle, indeed, is inaugurated with this tribute. Now, this is apparently the last that we hear of these princes, the heads of the tribes who lead the scouting of the land in Parsha Shlach. They're different people. What happened to these 12 princes? What's their epilogue, if you will? So we find something very surprising in the Midrash. This takes us to a really unexpected place. This is a really unexpected twist in their story. The Midrash refers to Parshas Korach. Korach is Moshe's first cousin who launches a rebellion against Moshe. And he has with him 250 heads of the tribe, men of distinction. But the Torah doesn't name, doesn't enumerate these 250 heads of tribes or head of the Sanhedrin or leaders of the people. But the Midrash tells us that it hints in the story of the princes, the current princes that we're talking about right now, the ones who were with Moshe and Aaron at the counting of the people, the ones who were the policemen in Egypt, the ones who brought the gifts of the oxen and the, the wagons and who brought the 12 days of tributes. It hints in their story that they were the same people who joined Korach's rebellion. And we know how that ended up. The sinkhole came and swallowed up the mutinous bunch. And then a flame came down from heaven. And this consumed the 250 leaders that joined the rebellion. And who was included amongst that group? According to the Midrash, the princes of our parsha. The heroes of our parsha, the people who didn't initially donate to the fundraising drive of the Mishkan of the Tabernacle, but brought the oxen and the wagons and the 21 animals and the silver basin and the silver bowl and the gold ladle, the people who went with Moshe and Aaron to count the people, to count the nation, or stood at their side when Moshe and Aaron counted the nation, these same people actually died in Korach's rebellion. What an ignominious way to go. And of course, this raises some questions. These were righteous people. These were righteous men. And they were beaten 
by the Egyptians to spare their brethren. And yes, they made a mistake. They waited until everyone else gave. And yes, they made a mistake. They didn't donate to the fundraising drive of the Mishkan initially. They said, we'll wait till everyone gives and we'll cover the balance. But they learned a lesson. And they fixed it by jumping ahead and sponsoring the wagons and the oxen. And they brought the second tribute over the course of 12 days. And they are instructed by God to stand by Moshe and Aaron. Moshe and Aaron counted the people. Yet somehow, soon after the events described in our Parsha, according to the Midrash, they join the rebellion against Moshe and Aaron, and they die in infamy. How did this happen? How do we make sense of the stark changes in the story of these 12 men? What is the connective tissue combining all the changes in their lives. So I want to suggest an approach. I want to suggest an approach that explains all the twists and turns in their story and how each development led to the next one. And of course, once we're done describing what happened with these princes, I think it will yield various valuable lessons for us. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's start from the beginning. Who are these 12 men? Who are these 12 princes? So we're told that they were officers in Egypt and they had a choice. Are they going to allow their charges to suffer at the hands of the Egyptians or are they going to absorb the blows themselves? And these princes were gallant. They were brave. They were heroes. Men of name, men of stature, men of distinction. These are really great and righteous people. And they were willing to suffer in order to spare others. They said, we'll take all those arrows in our back and we'll stay of our constituents. These 12 men are dynamos. And they are justly rewarded for their gallantry. And they're made into princes of the tribes. And what happens? Day after Yom Kippur, Moshe comes down with a second set of tablets, and we begin a fundraising drive for the components of the tabernacle. We need gold, silver, copper, all kinds of expensive wool and leather and gems and wood. And the princes say, there's no way that these poor, recently released slaves are going to be generous. There's surely going to be so much that won't be donated. So we're not going to donate at the very beginning. We'll wait. And whatever is not covered, we will cover. And what happened? In two days, the entire fundraising drive was concluded and there was almost nothing left for the princess. And the Torah says they made a mistake. And their mistake was that they underestimated the people that they were leading. They failed to recognize the supreme generosity and the supreme character of the people that, the lay people, the regular people that they were leading. Why? Why did the princes underestimate the people that they were leading? So here's my theory. Who are these people? These were the officers who were the patrons of the Jews. They saw them at their worst when they were slaves and they had to fulfill a certain quota of bricks every day. Otherwise, they would get whipped. And some days they didn't fulfill their quota. And these heroes said, you know what? I'm going to suffer on behalf of these people. They had pity on them and they absorbed the blows on their behalf. Perhaps we can suggest that it is precisely because of their heroism that they underestimated the people. These princes were the people's benefactors. They were like the big brother who fails to recognize the qualities, the great qualities of the common folk, of the lay people. They said, they're not going to be, I know these people, I saw them. I got to know them really well. There's going to be so much for us to cover. Let them give whatever they don't give, we'll cover. 
their perspective of who these people were was molded by when they covered on their behalf, when they were the officers who suffered on their behalf, and consequently, they didn't know who they were dealing with over here. And these leaders were harshly rebuked for it. A letter is deducted from their name. Because true leadership is not just to be kind to the underprivileged, to have pity on the downtrodden. True leadership is to help all in their time of need, but also, more importantly, to see and recognize and appreciate the qualities of the people that you're leading. And so begins the rehabilitation of the princes. They're rebuked. A letter is deducted from their names, and they take the message to heart. Now it's time for the inauguration of the tabernacle, and they come and donate the oxen and the cattle. So they're showing, number one, that they have kindness not only with the poor, the downtrodden, the underprivileged, the tired, the poor, the huddled masses. Here, they are showing concern with the Levites, with the clergymen. They're saying, we want to make sure that no one suffers. We want to do kindness with the Levites so they should not have to do backbreaking work. The same concern that the princes had with the commoners in Egypt, now they are displaying for the Levites. The princes are reforming. And their gift of six covered wagons and twelve oxen are accepted, and they proceed to act with more generosity, and each one of them donates 21 animals, a silver bowl, a silver basin, a gold ladle, over the course of the first 12 days of the tabernacle's operation. And then on the first day of the second month, so the first month is Nisan, and day one of Nisan is the inauguration. Day one of Ear, which is the second month, that's when the process described in Lassie's Parsha began of counting the people. It's important to note that even though this was told in Lassie's Parsha, the counting of the people, chronologically it happened after the events of this week's Parsha, and as we know, The Torah is not necessarily in chronological order. So Moshe and Aaron are told to go count the nation. And the Almighty tells him, bring with you these 12 heads of the tribe. They should come for a ride along with you in counting the people. And again, Rashi tells us they're not there to count the people themselves, but they're there to watch how Moshe and Aaron interact with the masses. And as we mentioned last week, Moshe and Aaron They meet every individual, they get to know them, they ask what their name is, and they inquire about their family, and they bless them. They see every individual Jew, people who quite recently were slaves in Egypt, they see them as individuals, and as people of stature, not as downtrodden slaves, but as the nation of God, as people who witnessed Sinai, People who are described as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Every individual has prominence and stature, and they bless every individual. And the princes are there not to count, but to be trained by Moshe and Aaron how to see the value and the greatness of the masses, of the lay people, of the populace. Again, the princes, the problem was that they saw the Jews as suffering slaves in need of patronage, in need of a big brother watching over them, someone to fight for them on their behalf, as if they were weak and and feeble and incapable. But no, Moshe and Aaron take them for the ride-along to show them that each individual is a son or a daughter of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Each has talent and greatness and nobility and distinction. Each is valuable. The princes are being trained to become great leaders. Initially, their kindness was only with the poor and the downtrodden, or the people that they perceived as such in Egypt. And now they're doing kindness with the Levites. And now Moshe and Aaron take them with them to go see the value of every individual, not just the Levites, but also the lay people. It seems like the princes are on their way to become truly great leaders. 
but they go wrong. And they join the Korach Rebellion. And what was the Korach Rebellion predicated upon? Korach tells Moshe and Aaron, Y'all are redundant. The whole nation is holy. Why do you lord over the people? Korach's problem with Moshe and Aaron, or at least his pitch, his sales pitch was, every individual is so holy and so special and has such prominence and stature that Moshe and Aaron, we don't need you as leaders. This is a nation that can survive without leaders. Each one is a leader. And the princes, sadly for them, and for us, they joined this populistic call. They started as people who pitied the masses and even were willing to suffer on their behalf. And as a result, they underestimated the masses. And then they're given this training to see the value and the greatness of every individual But they overcompensated. They swung too far. They went to the opposite extreme in appreciating the little guys, so much so that they began to sympathize with the sentiment that Moshe and Aaron are unnecessary. And they joined Korach's rebellion, and that was a fatal blunder, and they ended up dead in a divine, fiery conflagration as a result. Thus, we see that there is this continuity in the story of the princes where they had something great about them, but it wasn't perfect. And it was fixed, or there was an attempt to fix it, but they went too far to the other extreme, and that ended up quite poorly for them. I think this whole story has some valuable lessons for us. Sometimes, when you pity someone, you want to help them, it can actually cause you to not value the people that you're helping. And the trick is to be kind and generous and to help people and do whatever you can to aid them in their time of need, but still recognize their greatness. That's one lesson. There's another lesson here. It's easy to see someone who was pitiful, who was suffering, who was a slave. They clearly are in desperate need of help. It's easy to see their need. True kindness is when you notice all who need help, even people like the Levites. When you see them lugging around heavy beams, you have to think maybe they need some assistance too. Maybe I can arrange for them an ox, a wagon, something to help them. And then we see how success breeds success. They gave one gift, the 12 oxen and the six covered wagons, and that inspired them to give a second gift, the 12 days of tribute. They made one donation, and that inspired them to give another. And I find with, you know, with Torch, as everyone knows, we rely on fundraising. I see the same thing. The hardest donation to get is the first one. But once someone gives once, they like it so much that they're inspired to give again. Another lesson. Moshe and Aaron take the princess for a ride-along. This is like upper management giving middle management a lesson in leadership. This is not just a mass jumble of slaves. These are all individuals. Each one has a purpose. Each one has a name and a family and a history and goals and aspirations and a future and a unique role to play amongst the people. Each one's valuable. Each one's special. And the princes were really moved by this but they took it too far. They began to view the people as being so valuable and so special that they got to the point where they began to question who needs Moshe and Aaron and they joined the rebellion of Korach. This individualism is great, but it's gone too far when we forget who are our leaders. A couple of years ago, I was given a class like the class that we give in Shavuos It was on Shabbos. It's not recorded. You won't find it in the more than a thousand episodes that I have available online. It was on Shabbos. And we were studying the Parsha. I didn't remember what Parsha it was. But we read a verse. It was a group of people there. We read a verse. And I said, okay, what does this verse mean? So I said, what do we do when we don't know what a verse means? I said to the assembled people there, 
Well, we look at Rashi. Rashi's the greatest commentator. Let's see what he says to explain this verse. And there was a man there, and he said to me, why are we going to Rashi? Why do we want to hear what Rashi says? Let's hear what I have to say. I said to him, yeah, I want to hear what you have to say, but let's, let's first look at Rashi. So he says to me, who's Rashi? He's a person. I'm a person. He's entitled to his opinion, and I am entitled to mine. He's no better than me. So I responded to him off the cuff. I said to him, you, sir, are not worth the dust under Rashi's feet. Yes, you could say your piece. Yes, you could question Rashi. You know what? You could even offer a different approach than Rashi when you want to explain a verse. But our nation is doomed once we cease to have reverence for our great leaders. Individuality is great and needed and necessary. But the second you repudiate Moshe and Aaron, you have gone off the deep end. And by the way, that individual, there's a postscript to the story. Later on, I told him, I said, the Talmud says in the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 17a, that the worst sinners of Israel, they spend 12 months in Gehenna, in purgatory, and they're burned for 12 months. And after 12 months, their bodies are completely destroyed and their soul is just a pile of ashes and a wind comes and blows them under the feet of the righteous. And then it quotes a verse from Malachi to justify that. I told him that my grandfather in one of his books wrote about the great Rabbi Elio Lopian, who was one of the great rabbis who lived in Israel, passed away, I think, in 1970. And my grandfather testified that Rabbi Lapian most likely had a visitation from Elijah the prophet. You know, Elijah the prophet became like an angel, and he could come visit people who were really righteous, and this aforementioned Rabbi Lapian actually had a visitation from Elijah. And he said about this Talmud, that talks about the, the complete sinners who, whose souls burnt until it's dust and it's blown under the feet of the righteous, he says, this is a very lofty level. This is a very high level. And I really hope that I am righteous enough to attain this level. So I said to this individual that we had a scuffle over Rashi. I said to him, listen, I told you you're not worth the dust under Rashi's feet. But according to this, I'm not either worth the dust under Rashi's feet. So I don't view it as a criticism. I kind of felt bad because, you know, I said that to him and there were other people in the room. And it was a little, a little cringy and I felt bad. So I said, I apologized to him. I said, you know, this, this is actually like a compliment. Anyhow, that's that. So those are some of my thoughts on the princes. And now it's time for the A and Q answers and questions. This is, of course, the beloved and much anticipated part of the podcast where we go through a question on the Parsha and I submit it to you, the audience, to come up with an answer to this question and send me an email, rabbiwajima.com, with your answer. And the question comes from the end of chapter 6, where it tells us the blessing of the priests. In fact, we know blessings play a big part in our religion, but almost all the blessings are actually of rabbinic origin. They're not actually sourced in the Torah. The only blessing that's sourced in the Torah is the blessing we say after a bread meal, but even then, the text of the precise words of the blessing, that was codified by the sages. And yet, at the end of chapter 6, we see the blessing of the Kohanim, of the priests, and we have three verses that describe the blessings they're supposed to say, and that is the precise words that they still say today. Yevarecha Hashem Yishmarecha, May God bless you and guard you. May Hashem illuminate His countenance for you and be gracious to you. May Hashem lift His countenance to you and establish peace for you. And here's the question. We're getting a blessing from the priests. And they're like reading a script. Shouldn't it be a bit more personal? A bit more extemporaneous? Shouldn't they be able to ad lib a little bit and say something personal on behalf of us? Why are the priests following a prescribed text in this blessing? 
Why must it be in this format specifically? If you have an answer to this question, send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Okay, last week we asked the question about the transportation of the tabernacle. We pointed out that when the tabernacle is transported, certain ongoing operations of the tabernacle actually are maintained even when it's in transit. Namely, the fire is still on top of the altar and the bread is still on top of the table. The question is why? If we're moving it, if we're transporting it, doesn't it make sense to kind of clear things out? And then we'll do the normal operations once we settle down and we reassemble the tabernacle in our next place that we stop? So I want to suggest an answer. When we are settled, when things are going as expected, things are in maybe a a certain holding pattern, if you will, there's less of a risk. There's less of a risk of spiritual disruption. There's less of a risk of things going awry. But what happens when the box is shaking a little bit? When we move, when we are mobile, when things change, when the environment around us is in chaos, when there is a maelstrom and there's confusion and we're in a vortex and we're moving and things are unsettled. In that instance, there's a risk. There's a risk that we will drop from our stature And because of the uncertainty and instability, we're going to experience a spiritual descent. And perhaps the lesson is that when the tabernacle is moving, when things are a bit unsteady, you have to hold tight and be extra vigilant and make sure that even when things are a little bit unsteady, when things are going awry, that you don't lose your standing and you maintain your equilibrium and you ensure that the environment and the circumstances don't cause you to have a spiritual descent. I was thinking that the entire world essentially over the past year and a half, over the course of the pandemic, our whole lives were appended. School wasn't normal. Our communal life wasn't normal. Our business life wasn't normal. Shopping is not normal. Nothing's normal. And I think that this is a very valuable lesson during a time like this. When things are up in the air and things are not going as they normally do, there is a grave risk that someone could really lose their standing. I'm thinking now, thank God in the United States, anyone who wants a vaccination to be vaccinated. And I assume that all the shuls in the country are going to be open for business on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the upcoming high holidays, in a couple of months. And I'm very curious to see what the numbers are going to be. How big of a drop-off is there going to be from 2019 numbers to 2021 numbers? Because what happened? The entire world was in transit, if you will, Things were unsettled. Things weren't normal. And I wonder how many of our brethren we, so to speak, lost because of this risk when things are not normal, when things are up in the air, when things are chaotic. And I don't know how much of an effort there was to follow this idea to make sure that you hold on tight even when things go crazy. I wonder what kind of attrition our nation suffered, or at least membership, shall we say, suffered along the way. Let's hope and pray that our nation stays strong. Let's pray for our brethren in Israel who are going through a war, as you are aware of. And I thank you for listening. And again, my name is Yaakov Wolby, and I'm coming to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. And my email address is RabbiWalby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. You have an amazing rest of your day, an amazing rest of your week, a fantastic and fabulous and splendid Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.